basically different types of equations. There's not really a um, section for each type, like there's a section for just quadratic equations. Um, but we start to see uh, a series of other types of equations that uh, we, we're interested in solving. Uh, some of them follow similar behaviors to what we did on uh, the last um, session. Hold on a second. Here's what I found on the web for is of other types of equations that we're Hi. interested in solving us more than follow similar. I hate Siri. All right, so thank you. Um, all right, so there's going to be uh, maybe some similar patterns that we see, but nothing um, that I don't think we can't do. But uh, towards the end, there's going to be some uh, questions that deal directly with being able to use quadratic formula um, and, and to be able to do uh, product and sum techniques. When I say product and sum techniques, I'm talking about uh, the factoring technique where you multiply two numbers, you get to the C term and add up to give you uh, the B term. Um, this is just going to uh, be a series of equations that uh, at the onset, uh, maybe we do one or two steps uh, to maybe reorder some terms, uh, recognize maybe a, a greatest common factor, but we should be able to eventually get down to something uh, that looked like what we did last session uh, and we manipulate it in the same way we manipulated it in the last session. Um, so you see here, these are the five types of um, equations we're going to deal with today, polynomial equations, radical equations, equations with rational equations, um, and that's actually, and that should say equations with rational exponents. Um, equations in quadratic form, uh, and then some absolute value equations. Uh, it, it's not anything extremely difficult, and then there's going to be, you know, some of these uh, examples actually have uh, placed in further chapters, like chapter three and chapter four. Chapter three talks about basically how we solve um, pretty much any polynomial equation. Uh, X to the third, X to the fourth, X to the fifth, those types of things. Um, I think chapter uh, four deals with rational equations, so anything that has ratios in it. Uh, and especially when the uh, numerator and denominator have like binomials, like x minus 5 and x plus 2 and stuff like that, and the, and the numerators and, and denominators, and how we go about solving those. Uh, so you might see similar uh, equations later on as well. Uh, and this kind of just gives us a foundation for dealing with some of those uh, in, in those chapters. Uh, the first thing we want to think about when uh, we're asked to solve an equation, and the equation uh, is polynomial. So polynomial meaning this is the, and you'll see this again at some point, um, polynomial just means that you have some coefficient, and I'll just call it a sub n, okay, this, this kind of, uh, this subscript is just a kind of an identifier to tell me where that coefficient is in this whole list that I give you, uh, and then x raised to the n. So n is going to be a number. So this might be uh, like, you know, 3x to the fourth, okay? Uh, where a sub n is this 3, basically telling me it's the coefficient that goes with the uh, variable of x to the n, okay? Um, so my, my exponent is 4 then, uh, but then we'll have the next coefficient. So a lot of times we write that as a sub n minus 1, just tells me it's the next one in the list. Um, and then x to the n minus 1. So this might look like, you know, another coefficient. And these coefficients are arbitrary. They don't matter what they are. Um, but maybe it's a 6. And then x to the n minus 1 would be maybe x. If this was n, n minus 1 would be 3. Does that kind of make sense? Uh, and then we can have another coefficient called a sub n minus 2 times x to the n minus 2. So this could be maybe negative 4x. Now, n was 4, and minus 2 would be 2, something like that. And then what happens is that we keep adding these things down uh, until we get down to what we call a um, times x. Okay, so x to the first. Okay. Um, and then eventually a sub 1. Okay, which would just basically be a constant, maybe. Okay. Uh, so, 
you might see like you know 5x plus I don't know six something like that. That's a polynomial. That's that's just basically the generic definition for a polynomial. Uh, and that's something we've seen last session. We had ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, right? So instead of a sub n, a sub n minus one, a sub n minus two, they use a, b, and c as your coefficients. If you want to use, you know, in this case, a, b, c, d, e, and f as coefficients, whatever, it doesn't really matter. Um, anything in this format where you've got um, a coefficient times some x raised to a power plus some coefficient times x raised to a uh, lesser degree power all the way down through... Uh, to a constant, that's, that's polynomial. Um, and what you want to think about in regards to solving that is to factor, okay? Um, and, and there's going to be um, a, a much more detailed, in-depth uh, chapter about how to factor, say, something x to the fourth or x to the fifth or x to the sixth, um, depending basically on how big this leading term becomes and how big its exponent becomes. Uh, there's a lot of facts and theorems that uh, provide you insight on the solutions for, to something like this. But everything that is polynomial in nature, the first thing you want to think about is how to factor it. Okay? That's how we're going to solve uh, a lot of these things. So what happens is, in this first example, that's exactly what we have. We have something polynomial in nature. When I say x cubed, now I'm going to, I'm going to move everything. When I want to factor things, I'll move everything to one side. So minus 25x is equal to zero, okay? So that's similar to what we just had. Now, we skipped an x squared uh, coefficient, okay? That's not up there, a term. Uh, and there's not a constant term up there. And with polynomials, you can incorporate or exclude as many different uh, terms that you want, okay? Um, and, and in this case, if we're being maybe a little bit more specific on, on how this models a... Um, polynomial equation based off of the last definition we had, we could write this 1x cubed plus 0x squared minus 25x plus 0 is equal to 0. And then you see it goes x cubed, x squared, x to the first, and then my constant, right? Does that make sense? But when we have plus 0, that's kind of trivial to write that. This is plus 0 as well, kind of trivial to write that. So we just have x cubed minus 25x. All right. But what I want you guys to realize is that every time you see something like that, you want to think factor. All right. Um, we look at example two. It's it's a similar type of equation, right? We want to think factor. And that's how we're going to solve uh, these polynomial equations. The first thing you want to think about when you're factoring is kind of the easiest thing and see if there's a GCF, a greatest common factor that can be pulled out of every single term. Okay. Um, and when you have something that's cubed, okay, like they would call this a cubic equation, um, really right now the only way that you guys can solve it is if there's a GCF or if there's an example two is going to show up in another neat uh, trick that we can use. Um, but right now that's our only option for, for factoring something x cubed. Okay, so we look at these two terms. What do they have in common? X. So remember what factoring is. It's simply division. Okay, so I'm going to pull an X out of both of these terms. I'm going to divide by X. So if they X cubed and divide it by X, what are you left with? Good, X squared. And when I take negative 25 X and divide it by X, what are you left with? Negative 25. Okay, so <clears throat> doing that, Bringing that GCF out now provides us a product of two objects, a product of x and x squared minus 25. Okay. Well, if I'm multiplying two things together, if I'm multiplying that thing there and this thing together, and I get zero, what does one or both those things have to be themselves? Zero. Okay. That's the um, zero product theorem that we talked about last week, right? Or zero product property. Um, so now I'm going to write the smaller equations that x is equal to zero. And then over here, I'm going to write x squared minus 25 is equal to 0. So this is nice. Okay, that's, a, that's a solution. Okay. Um, when we write these, we're, we're going to write these uh, factors equal to 0. We're going to solve those equations. And that equation is just a, it's already solved basically once we write it. 
Uh, so x equals zero is one of our solutions. And now if I look at this thing, and this is the reason bring that GCF out was, was important. What does this look like now? Yeah, that's a difference of perfect squares. That, that's something we can factor using our, our techniques from last session, right? Um, so if you remember anything that is a difference of perfect squares, we had kind of a generic formula that says a difference of perfect squares is always going to be the square root of both things added together and in the square root of both things subtracted uh, in that order, got A minus B and A plus B. So here, the square root of this is going to be X, right? Square root of 25 is 5. So we get X plus 5. We get X minus 5. And both those things are equal to 0, right? Okay. Uh, it just basically provides us another iteration of the zero product property. So now if these two things multiply together, give me zero, then one or both of them equals zero, right? So I'll write, kind of run out of room here. Just come over here and do it. Uh, so x plus five is going to equal zero, and x minus five is equal to zero. So it gives me x equals negative five, and x equals positive five. And both those things now are solutions along with x equals zero to that original equation. And if you think about it, if we plug some stuff back in, just plug zero in real quick to this original equation. Zero times zero times zero gives me zero over on the left-hand side, right? And then 25 times zero gives me zero on the right-hand side. So I get zero is equal to zero, so that makes sense that that thing checks out, and that is a solution. Now, I'm going to try five, okay? Five times five times five is 125. Okay. If you take 25 times 5, you get 125 again, right? So that thing checks out. That one works. And if I plug negative 5 in, so I get negative 5 times negative 5 times negative 5, so that's negative 125. And then 25 times negative 5 gives me negative 125. So negative 125 does equal negative 125, so that one checks out as well. Okay. Just something to kind of think about. This gives you an idea of how many solutions you could have. Okay, you could have three solutions. Um, as you guys get into, I'll be gone by this this time, but you get into some of the um, other chapters where you, where you devote a lot of time to solving polynomial equations using uh, some other factor theorems, uh, you'll find out that there's actually three factors that we're going to get, which would ultimately lead us to either three solutions like we have here, uh, we might end up with uh, two solutions, or we might end up with one solution for that type of equation. Uh, and it's just something, it's just the nature of how um, this thing behaves, which will tell us uh, eventually then how many solutions we do have. So if I look at this um, picture of this curve, and, and again, it's just a no, it's another equation. So we've got the situation where um, we're crossing the x-axis, okay, graphically. So I'm going to look at x to the third minus 25x. Okay, I'm just going to kind of manipulate the x and y axes here because the y values get pretty big, pretty fast. So let's do something like that, okay? Uh, so we see our x-axis is only increasing by ones, but our uh, our y-axis is increasing by tens, right? But you see here that the equation that we said, x cubed minus 25x equals zero, when we solve that, we are finding the three spots where the green curve crosses the x-axis. One of those spots was at negative five, one of them was at zero, and the other one's at positive five. Okay, so that's kind of the graphical way uh, that we can uh, recognize our, our answers. If you guys are using your TIA 3 or 4, kind of give you, how you uh, an idea of how you would uh, maybe use your calculator to graph that. Let's see if I can make this visible for you guys. So, all right, so I would go to y equals, okay? Uh, and then again, just type in the x cubed. So with x cubed, um, it doesn't have it, so like x squared has its own key. 
uh, or the power to as zone key. Anything beyond that, you got the carrot key. Um, and then three minus then 25x. And now I want to graph that. So when we graph it here, the only thing, I mean, it, it looks pretty ugly. And in my view, I've, I've kind of messed around with this today uh, in another class. So let me go back to, if my view is messed up or I don't like it, I'm always going to go back to, I hit zoom. And I'm going to go down to six. Uh, it's kind of just the default and how your calculator was shipped. So it tells me, basically goes from negative 10 to positive 10 on the x-axis, negative 10 to positive 10 on the y-axis. But that's kind of an ugly curve. Okay, and I don't see everything that I want. So you guys can man, you can manipulate your window a little bit. Now on GeoGebra, it was a lot easier for me to ma manipulate it, and that's why I like those other calculators. Um, it takes a little bit of skill, a little bit of practice, uh, just messing around, uh, trial and error a lot of times to, to mess with your window uh, for a lot of uh, graphs that maybe you want to change a little bit, change the way they look to you. Um, if I look at this, I looked at my graph, and, and I know I'm looking for these points here, okay, where we cross the x-axis. So I, I don't really need to change my x-axis uh, any, uh, but I do want to manipulate my y-axis so I can see, you know, how far up that maximum is and how far low this minimum is over here. Um, so I'm going to hit the window key, which is that second key up top here. Uh, like I said, I'm not going to mess with my x-minimums and maximums, okay? So that tells me the x-axis is going from negative 10 to positive 10. This means, this X scale just means that every single uh, marking on my X axis, every tick mark, is representing one unit, okay? Uh, so right there, that's gonna tell me basically from the left-hand side of my screen to the right-hand side of my screen, I'll have 20 tick marks from negative 10 to positive 10. Um, my Y minimum, okay, this is where I, I kinda wanna adjust things. My Y minimum, um, maybe I wanna make that, I'll go negative 50. Uh, my Y maximum, make that positive 50. Now I don't want to go by, just because, you know, that's basically 100 units, right, in between those two things. Um, and if I think about the pixels on my screen, I don't have 100 vertical pixels, okay? Uh, so if I let my Y scale be 1, it's just going to be very cluttered and messy. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to let my Y scale be 10. So basically telling me that every single mark that I see on my Y axis is worth 10 units, okay? Uh, and now when I graph that thing, it does kind of squeeze it all in, fit in that curve, right? Okay. Uh, now I chose good values for, fifth, for, for uh, my Y axis. If I would have chose something like, I don't know, negative 45 and positive 45 and let me then leave this as one just to show you kind of what that's what that looks like with with the scale being so small if i graph it all right so i chose bad values and i don't really see that maximum right so it's kind of trial and error 45 wasn't big enough so go back and try something a little bit bigger does that make sense uh and the reason you know this looks like a kind of a double solid line right and that's because i've told it for every marking put a tick mark for every one unit i'm basically just run out of uh, pixels to do that, so it just boldens it and, and basically tells you um, your X scale, or sorry, your Y scale could probably just be changed and, and make it look a little bit better. So when I do change that to 50, and you change anything you want to. Your neighbor might have 50, uh, you might put negative 60 to 60, negative 75 to 75, whatever. Um, your Y scale, maybe you want to go by 20s, okay? Kind of show you what that looks like. So all that means then is that that first tick mark from there to that first tick mark is 20 units. From that one to that one will be another 20 units. So that's at a height of 40 right now and so forth. Does that kind of make sense? All right. So if I wanted to find these um, X values in, I would hit second calc, kind of what we did last time. I'm going to go to option two. So that's a zero. Hit enter. All right, now I got that weird cursor that I can move around, and I'm gonna—I'm just gonna—I go, always go the furthest one first, and then I move it to do this one, and then I move it to do that one. I just kind of move it along my x-axis from left to right. Uh, so it says left bound. So I know my x-intercept is right here where my cursor is. So I want to be to the left of that. Okay, so I want an x-value to the left of that. So that 
where my cursor is now is, is representing some x value that is to the left of where I think my x intercept is. I'll hit enter. Then I'll go to the right of where I think that x intercept is. And I'll hit enter. Okay. When you're doing that, uh, you want to make sure that your left bound uh, and your right bound, one of them is below your x axis and one of them is above your, your x axis, uh, essentially. Then hit enter. And it gives me that zero or that answer of negative five that we found uh, using the factoring techniques. Then you would just go through the entire process again. I'd hit second calc, come find this one here, which is going to be zero, zero, and then do this one here, which is going to be five, zero. Okay. Uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a great tool uh, to help you um, when you get stuck uh, doing something by hand. Um, and especially later on, we start talking about other. Um, equations that you have to factor inside of uh, using that might actually be kind of a jump start in, in some of the procedures that you're going to do with it. Okay. Is that something we can do? All right, let's do, uh, let's do example two. Let's look at that. Can everybody see it? Like, is this big enough? Okay. Uh, if I use it on my screen. Sometimes the colors look a lot better than what they do uh, on the on the projector. So if something doesn't isn't very clear, let me know because I usually am not looking up there, I'm looking here. Um, all right, so this is this is another polynomial equation, but it's different in the fact of how many terms we have. Here we have four terms. Okay. Um, and, and the first thing, especially when it's not uh, a quadratic. So this, this is what we call a cubic, anything with the largest degree being a power of three, you call it a cubic equation. Um, First thing, like I said, just like the last one, you want to look for a GCF, okay? So I, I look at all four terms and think about, is there something I can factor out of all of them, okay? And you start looking at them, well, there's an X in the first one, there's an X in the second one, there's an X in the third one, but in that 10, there's not an X, right? So we thought maybe there was something, but now uh, it doesn't come out of all of them, so that's a problem, okay? So the next thing you want to do, okay, if it's not a quadratic, okay, you're looking for how many terms you have. And if you have four terms, the next thing to do is uh, try to do factor by grouping. Okay, and that's um, actually it's the, the tool that's going to work here for us. Factor, it's right this way. Factor by grouping. Um, and if you remember one of the questions or a series of questions that we did uh, last week, um, you remember the A times C method where we uh, had to multiply the first and last terms together uh, to get some product, and then we looked for uh, two factors that multiply together to give me that number, but add up to give me my middle B term, and we expanded or rewrote that B term. Remember doing that? Okay. Um, this is kind of like that where it's, it's almost already done for you, okay, that the A times C uh, procedure. Now, it's a little bit different because of the uh, the exponents here, but it's already in four terms for you, okay? So when you have something in four terms and GCF didn't work, this is your option, and you're just going to group the first two over here, and then you're going to group the last two. And when you group those last two, try to sneak that sign in that grouping, okay? Um, I knew that was going to happen. There you go. Um, now what we're going to do is, is just focus on the black set of brackets and parentheses. What do both of those things have in common? An x squared. So we're going to factor out an x squared. Now this isn't a guarantee that this is going to work, okay? Uh, it's just an option, and as we start working through it, hopefully some of the, the information that we end up writing down will kind of elicit a thought that says, yes, this does work, or no, this doesn't work, uh, and then go from there. But if I take an x squared out of that, out of x cubed, what are you left with? Just x and then minus 5, good. Okay, so dividing x cubed by x squared leaves you just x, and dividing negative 5 x squared by x squared just gives you negative 5. Okay. If you're ever questioning whether yourself uh, whether you factored correctly, okay, factoring is just division, right? So I can undo division with what operation? 
multiplication. So just multiply that back out real quick and see that you do end up with that if you ever question whether you factored it correctly. Okay. Um, so that's nice. We've, we've found the common factor that exists inside those two things. Is there a common factor that exists inside the red stuff? Yeah, negative 2. So I get minus 2 here. Take a negative 2 out. Leaves me with x minus 5, right? And this is the stage where we make the, the argument whether this worked or not. Okay, and if you remember back to factor by grouping, the A times C method essentially, we were looking for that and that, the parts to be left in the parentheses to be the exact same binomial, right? When they're the exact same binomial, it tells you that this was, this works. Okay, so this is a feasible uh, technique. Okay, um, you know you might at some point get four terms. You try this, uh, and you do recognize that there's common factors that bring out both pairs, but what you're left with is not the same. Okay. So uh, if that ever happens, then it just basically tells you this approach does not work, and then you would have to use a different technique, okay, which you'll learn in, like I said, in the, in the next couple chapters. Mm -hmm. All right, so just like before, if, if these two uh, binomials are the same thing, they become a factor, so x minus 5. And then x squared minus 2, the things on the outside, they become a factor. And I'm left with that. Now I'm always curious, and, and I want to make sure that I've done something right. Okay, so uh, if if I find it necessary, I'm not confident maybe in what I've done. Could I foil this out? And if I foil it out, I should get back up to what I started with. If I think about this, what's x times x squared? X cubed. What's x? times negative 2, negative 2x. What's negative 5 times x squared? Negative 5x squared, right? And what's negative 5 times negative 2? Careful. Negative times negative. Give me, give me positive, right? So, and, and we've got the commutative property, so we can flip-flop those things around and move around as we, as we see fit. Um, so through the foiling process, then, we get back to what we started with. So it tells me that Everything I've done so far is correct, and this is this is the exact same thing as what we see up here. If you were to graph this on your calculator, and then graph this somewhere else, uh, like if you put this on y1 and you put this in y2, uh, you're going to see the exact same curve on top of itself. Okay, nothing new there. It's the same thing. All right, so this gets us down to the zero product property. These two things multiplied together give me zero, so that means one or both of them are zero. This one here, easy to solve, x equals five. Now the one on the right, a little bit more difficult to solve, but it brings to the surface maybe a reason why we talked about some of the, the examples from last uh, time is because this is, if you remember, this is the uh, square root property. Um, I'm not sure. I can't remember what they call it. square root. Um, I'm sure right property, but it's the technique for uh, solving a quadratic equation that doesn't have that b x term in it. Uh, and when you have that, you can simply just isolate your x squared. So I'll add two to both sides. And then do what to both sides? Yep. So I can square root this side, square root that side. And when you take square root, you get plus or minus 2. And again, we do get three different solutions. We get x equals 5, x equals root 2, and x equals the opposite of root 2. Um, And that graph, again, that graph is going to look similar to the last one we, we drew or came up with. It'll look something, um, do it this way. So root 2 is about 1.4. So maybe there, 
maybe there, and then what's the other one? Five. So five maybe over here. What this graph would look like, similar to the last one, something like that. Okay. And everything that's x cubed. So everything x squared is a parabola, right? Everything x cubed is going to be kind of that. You tilt your head, it looks like an S, right? Yeah, or an upside down S or something like that. Um, so it looks like one of these inverted S's. Uh, now there are variations on that depending on how big your coefficients are and how many um, of these other x squared, x to the first, and constants that you have. But for the most part, uh, all your x cubes are going to have the same general behavior. Does that make sense? Um, so that's that. That's uh, when you have four terms and, and you haven't learned eventually, I think, like I said, chapter three or four, we talk about what's called the rational root theorem, uh, which is really the kind of the, the overall governing uh, technique for factoring. I'd probably say about 90% of the things that we, we cover in this course could be factored by the rational root theorem. Um, so if you haven't learned that yet, this is uh, kind of the best approach. Okay, Even if you have learned that, this, this technique for this question is still the best approach. Is that all right? So then we'll get to example three. Example three is similar to what we've already done. What do you recognize inside each one of those terms? X squared. Okay. Um, so x squared is something that we can divide out or factor out. So when I divide x to the fourth by x squared, you're left with just x squared. When you take 4x cubed and divide it by x squared, you're left with just 4x. And we take 2x squared and divide it by x squared, you're left with 2. And that thing doesn't equal 0, right? Okay, so um, through all your factoring techniques, the hope is that, uh, you know, in, in, like in this case, when we, we took a GCF out, we break it down to smaller polynomials essentially that we have a better grasp on in a in, in a much better uh, set of techniques to uh, factor for instance okay x to the fourth plus 4x cubed plus 2x squared that's hard to factor but if I can break it down to this okay that blue stuff is a little bit easier to factor than what we started with right okay x squared a little bit easier to factor than what we started with so even though we've got two things here they themselves individually are easier to factor than what you started with Okay, uh, so again, it's the zero product property. You got two things being multiplied together to give you zero. So that means the x squared is zero, or the x squared plus 4x plus 2 is equal to zero. Just like every other time that we factor, except for the individual terms in that product equal to zero. <clears throat> so this one, a little bit easier to solve. Okay, And it almost sometimes people struggle with these uh, because it's so simple that we make it hard. Uh, but I just take square root of both sides, right? Okay, square root of zero is zero. Okay, now we'll come back and we'll, we'll talk about this one. So I'm going to put a little star here. Uh, come back and talk about that solution. Um, when we're done. <clears throat> and now we go over to, to this stuff here and we start thinking about all of our different techniques that we have to, to solve that. Okay, uh, A lot of times factoring problems start with something more complex and then you break it down to a series of easier, smaller uh, factoring problems. So um, this one's an easier, smaller factoring problem than what we started with. How can we factor that? Think about your options. First thing, is there a GCF in there? Is there something I can take out of everything? Nope. Okay. Uh, the next thing I want to do is I call it the product sum technique. Okay. Are there two numbers that multiply together to give me two, but add up to give me four? No. My only options are one and two, right? Okay. And then we're going to add up to three. 
Uh, so the proc sum technique doesn't work. Okay. My last op or my last uh, option here in in this um, basically with that coefficient right there is to use the quadratic formula, right? So we're going to use the quadratic formula this thing. And if you remember, the quadratic formula says x is equal to the opposite of b plus or minus b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. <clears throat> Remembering then what a, b, and c are. That's a, that's b, and that's c. So I'm just plugging those into the formula. The opposite of b would be negative 4, plus or minus b squared, so that's 16, minus 4, a is 1, c is 2, then all over 2a, a being 1, so it's just 2. So this is the answer, okay? It's just not in the preferred format. It's, it's unsimplified, okay? Uh, so we like to go inside to the, the discriminant here, okay? Uh, we want to evaluate that. So we get 16 minus 8. So on the outside, I get negative 4 plus or minus. 16 minus 8, excuse me, 8, right? All over 2 then. Okay. Uh, and that is the answer. It's just still not in the preferred format. Uh, that radical 8 uh, is not simplified. Okay. And when we deal with radicals and we we'll simplify radicals, essentially what we're doing is trying to find out the largest uh, perfect square that is inside 8. Okay. 8 is a composite number, meaning that you take a bunch of other numbers, multiply it together to get 8, right? Okay. Well, every composite number can be broken down to a series of uh, prime numbers multiplied together. Okay. So 8 can be uh, 2 times 2 times 2, right? Three prime numbers multiplied together. Um, but there is a perfect square that divides 8. What's the perfect square that divides 8? 4. Okay. So we could really rewrite this as negative 4 plus or minus. Okay, now 8, you know, maybe being a little bit more deliberate than what's necessary here, but radical 8 could be rewritten as radical 4 times radical 2, right? Okay, so I'm bringing, that's, that's the perfect square that divides 8. So bring that out, and now what is the square root of 4? 2, so this is really negative 4 plus or minus 2 radical 2 all over 2. Okay, still not the preferred way of writing it. Okay. Because when I have this negative 4 plus or minus 2 radical 2 over 2, it's really saying negative 4 over 2 plus or minus 2 radical 2 over 2. Does that make sense to everybody? So we can do a little bit of cancellation here. And 2s can come out of everything, right? And it leaves you negative 2 plus or minus root 2. But you can only cancel, like I, I, get, I get students to do this all the time. Um, let's see if I can write it on here. Let's say I have like 2 plus or minus 3 radical 2 or 2. I get students to do this all the time. Uh, it's going to be 1 plus or minus 3 radical 2. You can't do it that way because what this is saying, it's actually saying 2 over 2 plus or minus 3 radical 2 over 2. And now you can cancel these, but you still see that you have a 3 halves factor over here in this one, right? Okay. Um, so if I'm going to kind of do this convenient canceling technique that we use down here, that factor needs to be in all three parts. Okay. Um, and, and maybe the safest thing for you to do so you never make that mistake is to actually rewrite it as negative 4 over 2 plus or minus 2 radical 2 over 2. And now you can see that those do have a factor of 2. 
and these do have a factor of two, and you can cancel them that one. Okay. Uh, just, just some notation stuff that um, the more you see it, the better you get at it, the more uh, comfortable you get with it. Um, it's kind of the one thing that I like about math, but I also hate it, is that there are so many different ways of writing something. It's still saying the exact same thing. Um, but if you don't take the time to learn uh, the reasons why and why you can't uh, maybe rewrite some stuff, uh, could allow you to make simple errors like doing that and, and not knowing that that's not okay. Is that all right? Is that going to make sense? All right. So a lot of the equations that we that we deal with are going to um, hopefully break down to simpler quadratic equations that we can uh, end up factoring. Looking at this one again, so this was to the fourth power. Oh, wrong key, wrong mouse. Uh, this one's to the fourth power. Uh, so we think that maybe we should have four solutions, right? Or a potential of four solutions. Um, kind of like going off of what we talked about with this one. Okay, that one had three solutions, right? The one before that had three solutions. Now, you'll get into more detail uh, about the properties that allow us to uh, know how many solutions we will have and how many how, fa how many factors we will have uh, for any polynomial. But that's always kind of in the back of your mind. Well, what we've done here is we've gone through and we found we really only have this solution here. And we also had, what, uh, negative, negative 2 plus or minus uh, root 2. So that's one solution, and this is two solutions, right? What we really have here, x squared equals 0, um, there's actually two solutions there, okay? Uh, because x could be 0, and 0 times 0 gives me 0, right? But x could also be 0 again. That's basically what we're saying there. And we call that a double root, okay? Because uh, it shows up two times. And graphically what that means to us, um, we kind of talked about it with the discriminant on Thursday, when you have a double root, it basically means that your curve is going to be tangent to your x-axis at that point, meaning it's just going to touch your x-axis one time and then bounce back up in the direction it came from or bounce down uh, in, in the direction it came from. So if I graph this real quick, kind of show you that. x to the fourth. x to the fourth plus 4x four cubed plus 2x squared. Did I type that right? Plus 2x squared. <clears throat> All right. And I'm going to go back to a standard view so you can see a little bit better here. Um, and I'm actually going to probably zoom in here again in a moment. But... Right here we see uh, this this solution right here. I don't know why. It, oh, I clicked the wrong key. I want roots. All right, so that A right there, uh, this negative 3.41. So if you typed in your calculator, negative 2 minus the square root of 2, which is one of your solutions, right? It's negative 3.414, so forth. If you were to type in um, negative 2 plus the square root of 2, it gives you negative 0.59. And then you see we also have the answer of 0. But the answer of 0 here, if I go back, you can zoom in, I think. You see here at 0, your curve is coming down to that point. It's going to touch the x-axis at that, at that stage or that position, and then it's going to go back up in the direction it came from, right? Um, anytime that you have uh, a double root, you get that kind of behavior where you just touch your tangent to the x-axis and you bounce back up, okay? Um, and really, if you have two, two solutions that are exactly the same, that's going to happen. If you have four solutions that are exactly the same, that's going to happen. If you have six solutions that are exactly the same, that's going to happen. So anytime that you have an even number of the same solution, uh, we call it multiplicity. Um, whenever you have that, that's kind of the behavior that's occurring at that position. All right. Now, Cheryl will get into much more detail with you uh, in regards to that, but 
I, I do think as you're doing some of these initial questions, it might be a good idea to kind of have that in the back of your head to, to give you an idea of, you know, before I even do the problem, how many potential solutions am I looking at? Okay. Um, so I think that's that's useful in those those three examples. Is this all right with everybody? Stop me if you're going too fast, going too slow. Pick pace up. Or pick pace up a little faster. Trent. Mm -hmm. Alright. Um, these are uh, root equations, radical equations. Um, and for the most part, uh, they're dealing with square roots, cube roots. Um, and if you can really do those two, you might, be, might, might filter in a, a fourth root every once in a while. But if you can do a square root, cube root equation, um, the idea is that you should be able to do kind of any root. Um, so that's what we'll kind of focus on. Um, one thing we got to talk about is what we refer to as an extraneous solution. All right, so an extraneous solution is a solution that is created through the use of algebra that does not satisfy the original equation. Its creation is due to the algebraic technique. Okay. And it's Usually when squaring is occurring, whenever you're going to square something in an equation to make things a little bit easier for us, so, uh, we develop extraneous solutions, okay? It's simply um, the technique that we're going to use to uh, basically get rid of the square root symbol um, creates really a new algebraic equation, and the solutions to that new algebraic equation, equation um, Inside the solutions to the new algebraic equation are the solutions for the original one. There might be extra ones, okay? And we just got to decide uh, through basically a, a quick uh, substitution when we get our answers uh, whether an extraneous solution exists or not, okay? Um, a lot of times it turns out to be because it's, it's something that doesn't happen with every equation. Um, it does have, it is something you always want to check when you have square roots. Um, but it's, it's because we, we don't force ourselves to think about it a lot, okay, uh, because of the, the amount of uh, types of equations that don't have extraneous. So it is a step that people overlook a lot, okay? Yes, yes, yes. But if, if we don't check it, we never really know which one was the wrong one. But yes, you're right. It's uh, the develop, and I'm going to show you kind of the graphical approach behind the scenes of why. Uh, an extraneous solution shows up. Uh, the first thing I want to do with this is just give you the, the visual of what this equation looks like. And I'm not going to set it equal to zero or anything. I'm just going to 5 equals uh, square root of 4x minus 3. So I'm going to set 5 on as one equation. So I'll say y equals 5. And then the other one was square root of was it? 4x minus 3. All right, so let's get this thing back to All right, so we see this is y equals 5, okay, that horizontal line. And the purple is our root. Uh, if we ever graph a square root, they all kind of look that way, okay? Uh, they intersect. You see they're intersecting the next value of 7, right? Okay, so when we go through all our work, we should get a solution of 7. That's the only time that those two things intersect. Okay? But as we go through the work, the solution 7 is going to pop up, but a second solution is also going to pop up. Okay? And we have to be able to decipher which one we want. Um, so as I work through this, let's see here. 
And and I guess, I guess I maybe kind of misspoke a little bit. It's really going to happen, I think, mostly in that example, too. I don't think we see directly the two different solutions showing up in this one uh, just because of where the X is, but um, it, it is good to talk about anyways. When you have root equations, okay, you want to isolate the square root. You want to get that thing all by itself, okay? Um, because we're going to do some squaring um, processes here, and if we if we don't isolate it, it's going to make the squaring process very difficult, and it's not going to get uh, all our radicals to disappear. So, uh, for instance, if, you know, this one, it's already isolated, right? It's already by itself. If I go down to the next example, if I come down to this one, uh, this is not isolated, right? Okay, the square root symbol needs to be by itself. So I need to move this one to the other side, right? Okay, uh, if I look at this one here, uh, the square root is not by itself, so I would need to move the x to the other side. Uh, so those are some things that we'll do. Um, as we look at this one, okay, it's already isolated, so it's just like any other operation. If I want to undo multiplication, you use division, right? If you want to undo subtraction, you use addition. If I want to undo square roots, what power do I use to do that? Careful. I want to undo a square root. So you raise it to what power? Raise it to the second power. Okay. So I'm going to square this side here. And that should get rid of that root. Okay. But if I just do it to one side, now I have an unbalanced equation, right? So you have to square this side. Okay. So now I get 25 on the left. And I get. 4x minus 3 on the right. Does that make sense? Okay. So now this is what I want to show you. I want to go back to this. Okay. And now the equation that we're dealing with, we've developed a new equation, right? Let's see here. I'm going to graph the new equation on the right hand side here. Uh, we have 25. y equals 25, and we have 4x minus 3, okay? So now the algebra has created these two lines, okay? This is y equals 25 here, and this one here is 4x minus 3. But if I look at where they intersect, The intersection of those points is at A, and we're always looking for the X value of an intersection. It's still 7, right? Over here, the intersection of, of these two was 7 as well, right? So the solutions to this equation, the 25 equals 4X minus 3, those solutions are solutions to this one. Okay, all right, let me rephrase it this way. All the solutions for this one exist inside the solutions for this one. All right, and this is just a situation where this one has one solution, this one has one solution. Okay, so in this case, there are no extraneous roots for this particular problem. So we should be able, you know, we broke this down to now a multi step equation, right? Add three to both sides, I get 28 is equal to 4x, divide both sides by 4 x ends up being 7. And that's my solution. Okay. If I plug it back in to the original, I should still get a true statement. Okay. So, you know, 5 equals, plug in 7 here, I get uh, 28 minus 3. 28 minus 3 is 5. Or sorry, 25. So square root of 25, is that still 5? Yeah, so I get a true statement, so it does work. Um, now let's see if uh, do we do we understand the idea that when we when we start manipulating equations, the graph behind the scenes starts to change, right? However, when we get a new graph in the background, the solutions or the intersections of that new graph still have the same x coordinate as the intersection of the original graph. Okay, um, you know, for instance, this this is one graph, right? That was the original one we we drew. Guy came up with. This was another 
different graphing system, right? If I look at this, the line y equals 28 and the line y equals 4x, that's different than those two. But where are these two going to intersect? At 7, right? These two inter intersected at 7 and these two intersected at 7. Okay? Uh, so kind of behind the scenes, the, the graph is morphing, but the solutions, the intersections of those graphs is still the same x value. So what happens when we get something a little bit more complicated? Let's look at this one. Like I said, we want to isolate uh, the square root term, okay? Uh, and I like to make it positive. It's just kind of my um, I don't know, pet peeve or whatever. I like, to, I like that number to be, I like my root to be positive. Um, so as I start to isolate it, I'm going to take care of that. Uh, it's not extremely necessary, but it is, I think, useful. So I'm going to subtract 1 from both sides. All right, so when I do that, I now have 2x minus 1 is equal to the opposite of the square root of 2 minus x, right? How can I get that opposite? Yeah, multiply both sides by negative 1, right? So multiply both sides by negative 1 just gives me negative 2x plus 1 is equal to the square root of 2 minus x. All right, it's just the way, I don't know if that was the way I was first taught, and so I beat that in my head when I was younger, and... Uh, that's the way I deal with it. Um, like I said, it's not entirely necessary to do that. Um, but I like that to be a plus sign. So here's the idea. If I look at uh, what we're doing here, remember there's a graph behind this. Okay, and it's going to be a similar looking graph to the one we just uh, showed you. And they're going to intersect uh, one time. Okay. When I look at this one, Okay, and I start doing some of the manipulation that we're going to do. We're going to develop a, a different set of graphs, and, and they're going to probably intersect more times than what the original ones did. Okay, and that's, that's kind of the issue of those extraneous solutions. So once I've isolated the, the square root, what do I want to do? I want to square both sides. So I square this side. I'm going to come over here. I'm going to square that side. So I'm going to square the right-hand side. It just gives me 2 minus x, right? The root and the power inverses the undo each other. Okay. Now on the left hand side, this is just where you got to be um, kind of cautious and deliberate and understand what it means for squaring a binomial. We're squaring a binomial. Negative two x plus one squared is equal to negative two x plus one times negative two x plus one. If it looks like this, what would you have to do? Foil. Okay. Uh, and the reason I write that is that most people are going to square the first term, square the last term, and miss the O and I's. Okay? So make sure that you, you pay attention to that stuff. So take negative 2x times negative 2x gives me 4x squared, right? Uh, negative 2x uh, times 1 gives me negative 2x. And then negative 2x times this 1 will give me another negative 2x. So it gives me negative 4x total. And then last times last will give me positive 1. Some of you might know uh, kind of this shortcut for multiplying or squaring a binomial. If I have a plus b squared, you square the first term, you square the last term, and now you multiply them together and double them to give you the middle. So that's kind of what we did here. If I square the first term, do I get 4x squared? If I square the last term, do I get 1? Now, if I multiply these two things together, it gives me negative 2x. And you double that, it gives you negative 4x, right? So that might be a, a rule that some of you might have remembered from some, per, some previous courses. But now, once I have that, I have now developed a quadratic equation, right? When you develop a quadratic equation, what's the first word that com should come to mind in regards to solving it? Starts with an F. Factory. Okay. And when you want to factor, you should get everything equal to zero. So I'm gonna get 4x squared. Uh, I'm gonna add x to both sides, so it gives me negative 3x. And subtract 2 from both sides, so I get negative 1 is equal to zero. Okay. So I want to show you 
And I know I'm jumping back and forth, but I think it's, it's, it's important to understand why we're doing what we're doing. Um, I'm going to show you what these two things look like. We started with the left-hand side was just 2x. So 2x is that line. And the right-hand side is 1 minus the square root of 2 minus x. Okay, enter. So what we're looking at solution-wise is where those two curves intersect, right? So it's whatever this x value is. We can, we can do it real quick. It's the x value of, oh, why didn't it do that? Intersect. That one, that one. All right, so we should get negative one-fourth, okay? So that's what we started with. But we have just manipulated things. We have created now a new equation after we've done that squaring process. And that new equation is 4x squared. Was it minus 3x? What was the other? Minus 1. Minus 1 equals zero, right? So now equals zero. Now we get two solutions. That makes sense? Two places where we cross the x-axis. This one here of one is extraneous. It's going to be the extra one we get. And this one here of negative 1.4 is the one that's going to, or negative one-fourth, sorry. That's the one that's, that we're really looking for. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. So the squaring process changes the graphs that are behind the scene. Okay. But however, what, what we need to understand is that all the solutions to this one, all the solutions to the original one that we are interested in, exist inside the set of solutions to this one. All right? So the negative one-fourth that we're looking for, it's in here somewhere. We just got to decide which one it is. Okay? Uh, so that's what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, but once we get down to this, now it's just factoring. Okay? Um, so I'm going to try... You know, GCF, see if there's anything that divides all three terms. Nothing happens there. Uh, so now I'm going to try the A times C method. I'm going to go 4 times negative 1. So it gives me negative 4, right? Are there two numbers that multiply together that give me negative 4 but have to give me negative 3? Negative 4 and positive 1, right? Okay. So this is where we're going to go 4x squared. And now this middle term gets rewritten as the sum of these two things times x. So negative 4x plus 1x. And then this one will be minus 1. So the, the first term and the last term stay 4x squared minus 1. And then we rewrite the middle term as the sum of those two factors. Okay. And now it looks much like Maybe one of the original questions we did today where we factored by grouping. You got four terms? Try factor by grouping. So I'm going to group those two, and then I'll group those two. What do these two have in common? 4x. It's going to leave me x minus 1, right? What do these two have in common? Just a 1. So we're going to 1. Gives me x minus 1. So now... The terms that were in the, the parentheses are identical, so that's a factor. And then the terms that are on the outside, the 4x plus 1, they become a factor as well. So now those two things multiply together give me 0, so x minus 1 is equal to 0, or 4x plus 1 is equal to 0. x is equal to 1, and this one here, um, x is equal to negative a fourth. Now here's the thing, we've got to have the ability to decipher which one of those works. Sometimes both will work, uh, sometimes uh, one will work, sometimes none will work, or neither will work. Okay, we just got to plug things back in and check. And the way we do this is we take our x and plug it back in here. Okay, so if x is negative one fourth, this is this is the way I would do it, guys, just to uh, maybe expedite the process a little bit. especially as your original equations get a little bit more um, kind of cumbersome. 
is I take the calculator. Uh, I'm going to take uh, negative one fourth. So that's that. And we'll store it as x. And now I'm just going to evaluate. I'm going to take two times x. It gives me negative one half, right? So now when I evaluate that on the right hand side, when I go one minus the square root of 2 minus x. I'm looking forward to giving me the exact same value back, right? I'm looking for negative 0.5 back. Hit enter and I get negative 0.5 back. So that tells me, since I got a true statement, negative 0.5 equals negative 0.5, that is a solution. But now I got to check the other one. So I'm going to hit 1, the STO button, the store button, as x, hit enter, all right? Now I'm kind of lazy. I don't want to have to type these things back in. If I hit second, enter, and I keep doing that until I get to the 2x to show up. So second, enter again, second, enter again, and it gives me 2x. Obviously, that might be something you do in your head anyways. 2x times 1 just should be 2. And now I'm going to hit second, enter to recall this side, which is the right-hand side. Second, enter, second, enter, second, enter. And now it's going to evaluate essentially... Uh, that thing with x being 1, okay? Well, when I do that, you can do this in your head too. It should give me 0 back, okay? Does 2 equal 0? No. So what we're doing there is that when we plugged in, when we plugged in uh, negative 1 fourth, we got negative 1 half up here equal to negative 1 half right there. That's a true statement, right? So that's why we circle that. It gives us a true statement. It is a, is a true answer. If I plug in 1, I get 2 here, but I get 0 over there, right? Is 2 ever equal to 0? No, that's a false statement. Meaning, x equals negative 1 does not work. X, sorry, x equals 1 does not work. Uh, that is our extraneous solution. That's the solution that occurs simply because of that squaring process right here. Okay, And it's, it's the idea that the, the graph behind the scenes has gone from basically linear, okay, linear uh, equation and a root equation to a line and a parabola. And lines and parabolas a lot of times intersect two times, okay. Um, so that's kind of the nuts and bolts of why we have to check extraneous solutions. Um, obviously, when you're doing these, you're probably not going to graph every single one of them and look and analyze the graphs of every single one of them, but I wanted you to realize you know, it's not just hocus pocus on why we have to cancel some solutions out and keep some. Does that make sense? Okay. So this one here, um, same thing. Uh, isolate the the root first. Okay. So um, you know, maybe in this one, I just see that I can move the three to this side, so get x minus three, and move that thing to the other side. And I get root of x minus 1. And that, I just do it that way because that makes that root positive. Like I said, I'm doing that. Uh, so now, once I've isolated this thing, what do I want to do to both sides? Square both sides, right? So square that. And I'll square that. So the right-hand side, that's easy. x minus 1. And when you square a radical, all you're left with is the radicand. Okay, the number or the expression underneath the radical. Uh, and now x minus 3 squared, going off of kind of that shortcut technique, square the first term, gives me x squared. Square the last term, gives me 9. Multiply these two things together, and then double that. So negative 3x doubled would give me negative 6x, right? So now we're gonna we got x squared, so we're gonna factor. So we get x squared, subtract x from both sides, add one to both sides. Gives me that thing. And now we'll go x minus five, x minus two. Two numbers multiply together, give me ten. 
negative five, negative two, and those two things have to be negative seven. So what are my two solutions? And X are both. X could be five and positive two. And that's just a matter of plugging back in. Okay. Um, and I'm just going to do it by hand here. Put five in. I get five minus. Okay. Put five in here. Five minus one would be four, right? So you get five minus square root of four is just two, right? So five minus two is that equal three? Yep. So that is a solution. Now, just because I circled that one and that's a solution does not mean the other one doesn't work, right? Okay, the other one could work. Um, so I plug the other one, I get 2 minus. Now here I get 2 minus 1. See if that's equal to 3. 2 minus 1 is just 1, right? Square root of 1 is just 1, right? Is 2 minus 1 equal 3? Nope, that's a false statement. Extraneous solution. All right, so I just wanted to show you, uh, you know, you could, just depending on your uh, equation that you develop, initially, you can't have a square. So this is the square root. Um, okay, it's just uh, two, I think it's actually three times square root um, of x. And then this, this black line, uh, you can see that a line in a root could, inter could intersect two times. Does that make sense? So you might, when you go through this process, you might get uh, both your solutions to work. And if both solutions work, this would have been kind of the original picture that you would have gotten behind the scenes with your original equation. Um, so that, that is always something that um, people want to do. Just because you find a solution that works does not automatically classify the other solution as not working. Right? Uh, so just make sure you understand that. This one here, you got two square roots, right? So the only thing, the only issue here is when you want to solve an equation with two square roots, you have to isolate one of your radicals. Okay. Uh, so I look at that. Is is the one on the left already isolated? Yeah. So you isolate one of your radicals, and then you just go uh, along the same path as what you did in the last ones. So you square both sides. Okay. Um, the squaring process is going to start getting rid of radicals, right? Now, when I square the left-hand side, it's really nice because the root and the power cancel out, and I'm left with 3x plus 1, right? Now, when I square the right-hand side, the right-hand side is a binomial, right? So what I'm saying there on the right-hand side is that I have 2 plus the square root of x plus 1 times 2 plus the square root of x plus 1. And you have to foil that. Okay, so first times first, what's 2 times 2? 4. And then I take 2 times that thing, right? And it's just 2 times root x plus 1. That's how you write it. Okay, um, so you write the implied multiplication of those two terms. Then when I do the insides, it's the same thing. So I got plus 2 root x plus 1. And then you do last times last. Okay. Well, last times last is nice in this case because if I had, just think about this, square root of 3 times square root of 3, what's that give you? Square root of 9, right? Or if you write this way, maybe it makes more sense to write this way, it gives you that, doesn't it? And don't those cancel out? So when I write radical x plus 1 times radical x plus 1, that really means 
radical x plus 1 squared, doesn't it? So those cancel out. Okay. So when I take radical x plus 1 here as last times last, all I'm left with is the stuff on the inside, the x plus 1. It's just a little bit messier uh, multiplication than what the last one provided. But now I can, I can start simplifying. I can take 3x plus 1 is equal to 4. Now this stuff here, these are like terms. Okay, the, the root x plus 1 is kind of like our variable uh, term here. So there's 2's out in front. So we combine the 2's. So this is 4 root x plus 1's plus x plus 1. So there's still more combining of like terms that can be done here. Um, 3x plus 1, what gives me 5, plus x plus 4, times root x plus 1. Okay? So, squaring both sides, and then this is a general practice. Everybody you see multiple square roots. Um, you get something like that. You got rid of one of the square roots, right? So that blue equation is now a new equation. It now only has one square root. So what we do is we go through the process again. We go through one more iteration of isolating the root and then squaring it. So I want to isolate this root. So I'm going to get all the other stuff on the other side. So I'll remove an x. So it gives me 2x. I'll remove the 5. So it gives me negative 4. Is now equal to 4 times root x plus 1. Now, it's not imperative that you do this, but I, I like to do it this way. I like to get that 4 to be a 1. So I'm going to divide everything by 4 as well. So it gives me um, 1 half x. I'm sure write this way, x over 2. Minus 1 is equal to the root of x plus 1. So we isolated that square root. And now when I isolate the square root, now what I want to do? Say again? <laughs> Okay, and, it, and it's by itself, right? Uh, careful. So you want to take this one and put it back over here? So if I add one here and then add one here, I've now unisolated this term, right? I've, brought, I, I've put something else with it. Careful. When, when we, we isolate, we squared up here once we had it isolated, right? So if we isolate here, we want to square again. And then we'll square this side. So now what we get is x over 2 squared is x over 2 times x over 2. So it gives me x squared over 4. Um, I'm going to get, when I multiply these two things together, I get negative x over 2. But I'm going to double that. So I get negative x, and I'll square the last term and get plus 1, and this becomes x plus 1. Now, seeing just one of these examples, guys, this is by far not enough for us to really get good at this. You're going to have to go, uh, you know, search out some some additional resources to open the textbook and, and see the examples in the textbook of them walking you through this process again. Maybe watch this video several times uh, to really get a, uh, a good uh, understanding of what's going on. Uh, but what is kind of nice here, uh, when I, I have x squared here, so I want to factor, so I'm going to get that uh, right-hand side to be 0. So I get x squared over 4. Uh, I'll subtract x from both sides, so it gives me minus 2x. And then the ones cancel each other out, right? So it gives me a zero. Okay, now I wrote it as x squared over four, but you can also write it this way: one fourth x squared minus two x equals zero. Now, write it that way, you might recognize what do they both have in common? Now, there's a GCF of x in there, right? So take an x out. I'm left with one fourth x minus two is equal to zero. So I have a product of two things equals zero, so x is zero. Or one fourth x minus two is equal to zero. 
kind of running out of room here. I can't move. I don't think I can move that stuff. I think it just stays still. So let me. I'd add two to both sides, so I get a fourth x is equal to two. And then multiply everything by both sides by four it gives me x to be eight. So I got two solutions. X is zero, and x is eight. And then I just got to make sure, you know, do they work? Come back up here. If x is zero, I get square root of one right there, right? Which square root of one is just one, right? Okay. Plug in here, I get two plus square root of one, which is just square root of one is just one, right? Does one equal three? No. So that is not a solution. Okay. Then I'm going to try eight. Plug eight in. I get what, 24 here plus one is the square root of 25, which is just five, right? Plug eight in here. I get two plus square root of nine. The square root of nine is three. So the right hand side is five, right? So you have five equals five. So eight is the solution. Zero is the extraneous. I know it's a long process, all right? Um, and usually, you know, on testing quizzes, you can't see every one of these types of questions on a test or a quiz, right? I mean, that took us, I don't know how long that took, but that took some time, right? Uh, so in, in a course that has an hour and a half, two hour test, uh, are you going to see five of those? Oh, no. Okay. Next question. Okay. Is, is it doable? Or doable? Okay. Um, keep on going. All right. Solving equations with rational exponents. Okay. Uh, a rational exponent is just another way of writing roots. Okay. Um, you're going to want to write this down. It's going to be. Uh, x, I'm going to write uh, a over b as the exponent, a over b, is equal to, so when you have x raised to a rational exponent, okay, you can rewrite that as the beth root, I don't know if beth is the Right, maybe you should use a different letter. Um, so if you know if your your denominator here was a two, this would be a square root. If this was a three, it'd be a cube root. If it was a four, it'd be a fourth root, and so forth. Of x raised to the a. Okay. So when I see x to the three halves, that's the same thing. Okay. So the b is the denominator, so that's the root. And x cubed stays on the inside. So it's saying the same thing. When I say x raised to a 3 halves, it's saying the exact same thing as the cube root, or sorry, the square root of x cubed. Okay. Uh, so that's useful. Um, as we go through some of these questions, um, we might uh, analyze that or look that. Another, uh, another uh, exponent property that is useful is that when I have... Uh, let's say x raised to the negative uh, m. Okay, we don't like negative exponents, right? So if you have negative exponents, you want to rewrite that as one over x to the m. Okay, and, and basically what happens is that wherever the negative exponent exists, um, you want to take it to the other. Whether if it starts in the numerator. You want to take that negative exponent and put it in the denominator, and it turns into a positive exponent. Or if you start with something like uh, 1 over x to the I'll just use negative n, you would want to rewrite that as x to the positive n over 1. See how that went? That negative exponent went to the numerator. Okay. This one goes to the denominator. Those are, those are two rules um, that hopefully you've seen uh, already. Uh, and we're going to use that one in this question. Okay, when you have negative exponents, uh, that is a huge problem in regards to starting the equation. So, uh, what you're going to want to do is just rewrite this thing so that you do not have any negative exponents. So, I'm going to write this as 
x to the 3 halves minus 10 x to the 1 half. And now it's going to be plus 25, okay? Because this exponent here only goes to the object or the symbol that is directly behind. So it's only directly behind the x, right? So the x is raised to a negative 1 half. I don't want it to be a negative exponent. So I'm going to drop it down to the denominator. And once I drop it down to the denominator, it now becomes a positive exponent. Does that make sense, everybody? So 25x to the negative 1 half is exactly the same thing as 25 over x to the 1 half. All right. So this is a rational equation. Just like all of our rational equations that we've seen so far, when we have denominators, we like to multiply by the least common denominator to get all denominators go away, right? So let's multiply this entire thing by that denominator because that's going to get things to go away, right? So we multiply everything by x to the 1 half. Okay. Now the only thing that you have to pay attention here is another rule that when you multiply like bases, what do you do with their exponents? For instance, if I had like x squared times x to the third, you'd write that as what? x to the fifth, right? What'd you do to the exponents? You add them. So if I have x to the a times x to the b, it becomes x to the a plus b, right? So that's the same thing here. If I get x to the one half times x to the three halves, what are you going to do with those? Add them together, you x to the four halves, which is just x squared, isn't it? Okay. Now I'm going to multiply x to the 1 half times that term. This gives me negative 10 x to the 1 half plus 1 half gives me 1, right? And I'm going to multiply x to the 1 half, excuse me, times the last term. And now because it should be 25 x to the 1 half divided by x to the 1 half, what happens to this? x to 1 half and that x to 1 half cancel out. Just leaves me with plus 25. And then x to 1 half times 0 is just obviously 0. So it started off pretty ugly, right? But we do one step and now does it turn into a quadratic equation? And we should be able to factor that just to save a little bit of time. Factor it for you. It's x minus 5 times x minus 5, right? So then you get x to be 5, and x to be 5, you get two solutions, but they're the same solution. So thinking graphically what that means to us, it should be a, uh, a curve. It's not a parabola, but it's, it looks kind of parabolic. Uh, but it just bumps the, um, the x-axis at 5. This, this thing is not a parabola. Okay, This is, okay, uh, but the solution to this original one exist inside the solutions to this one. All right, so similar thing here. I'm going to write this as x to the 1 half minus 1 over x to the 1 half, minus then 6 over x to the 3 halves. Just taking every single one of those negative exponents and putting it into the respective either denominator or numerator to make it positive. In this case, they both went to denominators to become positive. And now you have rational equation again, right? And you have common denominators, or you need, you have the necessity for common denominators, or at least common denominator here, uh, to multiply everything by. So we know the denominator is going to incorporate x, right? Okay, or my LCD is going to incorporate x. And it's kind of the same principle that we talked about uh, last week. If I'm multiplying by an LCD, then every denominator needs to show up. And if I have multiple uh, factors, I take the one that has the highest exponent. Okay, so x and x, okay, they're both the same factor, right? Take the one that has the largest exponent. So x to the 3 halves.
So that's when we'll multiply everything by the left hand side and the right hand side to get something that's solvable. So when I distribute that x to the 3 halves to everything, I'm going to add again. So it gives me x to the 4 halves, which is just 2. Okay. Uh, now, when I multiply x to the 3 halves times that, okay, you're going to get minus x to the 3 halves up top and x to the 1 half on the bottom, right? Do you guys remember what you do with... Um, like bases in regards to their exponents when you do division, subtract them. So I got three halves minus a half here gives me just one. So you get x minus one. Or not, I said that wrong. It gives me minus one x when I multiply x to three halves times that thing. So this is going to be, you can rewrite this if you wanted to on the side, three halves minus a half, which just gives me x to the first. And it was a minus there in front, so minus 1x. And then when I multiply that towards the last terms, the x to the 3 halves on top and the x to the 3 halves on the bottom, cancel each other out, you can only use minus 6. Is that something we can factor then? x minus 2. Oh, sorry, x minus 3. And x plus 2. So x equals 3. And x equals negative 2. Now, here's kind of a situation where we've got to think um, about our answer because really what this thing here is saying, if, if I rewrote this using some of the uh, properties that I said before, x to the 1 half is the same thing as the square root of x. So I'm going to rewrite this thing this way real quick. That's the same thing as what we started with, okay? Can you take square roots of negative numbers right now? If I, if I can take square roots of negative numbers, what that means to me is there, so if I put negative 2 in here as, as x, I'd have square root of negative 2. Is there a number that can multiply by itself two times to get negative 2? It's impossible, right? Because whatever number it is, it's either positive, so positive times positive, you can get a positive result, right? Or it's negative, so a negative times a negative should give me a positive result as well. So there's absolutely no way I can take any number, multiply it by itself twice, and get negative 2. So that tells me that that solution doesn't work. Okay, 3 is my only option here. And if we were to graph this thing, we see that it only crosses the x-axis at 3. Just to, because we're running out of time, and I'm not very good at pacing myself with this stuff. Um, I will I will do a video of example three. It's not that hard. Um, example four is actually, I think, uh, better if it was explained or seen inside this last grouping of, uh, of types of problems. So we'll do these uh, examples here and then um, also get you something. Hopefully, maybe we can talk about a couple questions of absolute value if that's not that hard. Um, all right, so the ones that, again, the ones that we don't cover directly, I will put together a video uh, either this evening or uh, tomorrow and post that for you so you guys can watch those examples. Um, so if I get x to the fourth minus 4x squared plus 3, these are what we refer to as equations in quadratic form, and these become very useful uh, elsewhere throughout the textbook, and they show up a lot. Uh, at least this technique shows up several times. Um, and what we mean by quadratic form is that if we look at the exponents here in the original quadratic equation, you see how the middle exponent is half of the first exponent? Anything that shows that behavior is quadratic form. So we see here, you see that 2 is half of that 4? So it tells us in quad, this thing's in quadratic form, meaning that we could essentially rewrite this so that it was a quadratic equation. All right, uh, and this is kind of the technique that we—I I, I, don't—I don't like writing it this way, but let me just show you this because this is what they mean. Uh, I could rewrite this thing as x squared squared. Is that still x to the fourth minus then 
4, let's do it this way, minus 4x squared to the first plus 3 is equal to 0. And now you see you've got some a, and in this case it's 1. My eraser doesn't always want to work. Um, so you've got something squared, you've got something to the first power, and you've got a constant. Does that kind of make sense, everybody? I hate writing it that way. It's a pain in the butt. Uh, but if you can recognize that um, you've got that middle term to be half of your original or your first term, this is kind of the process that we're going to do to make this a little bit easier. We're going to say when this happens, you're always going to take that term, okay? And you're going to let that be a new variable. So we're going to say let x squared equal u. So let, I always write it this way, u equal x squared. So if u is x squared, what would u squared be? If I squared the left-hand side, why not the square the right-hand side? So it makes sense that u squared would be x to the fourth. So now you can see that that thing right there, I'm going to change it to u squared. This thing here, x squared was u, right? So I'm going to write this as minus 4u, and then plus 3 is equal to 0. That thing is a little bit easier factor, isn't it? u squared minus 4u plus 3. Can we factor that for u? Can we rewrite this as u minus 3 times u minus 1 is equal to 0? Does that make sense? So then u is 3. From that one, u would be 3. And from this one, u would be 1, right? But we just now solved it for u. We need to do what we call back substitute, which basically undoes the original substitution that we made. Okay? So if u was 3, come back up here. U is actually x squared, so let's rewrite this as x squared is 3. And this is saying u was 1, but u was x squared, so x squared is 1. Yep, so uh, be, be careful. So you, you're going to solve for x, right? So we square root this, square root that, right? So you x equals plus or minus square root of 3. And then do the same thing here. You get x equals plus or minus square root of 1 which is just plus or minus 1. Where did I lose you? Okay, because originally, when we, when we made this substitution, we substituted and made that equation a little bit easier, right? So we go through and we solve that equation. You have any, no problem solving that equation, right? So we solved it for u, a variable that the problem really didn't know existed, right? We, we, we decided to, to, to input that and insert that in, so we solved it for u. We, want, we always want to solve for the variable that we start with, right? We want to solve, solve for x. So at this stage, when u is equal to 3, we need to come back and bring x back into the problem. So wherever I see u, I'm going to replace it back with x squared. So that gives me x squared equals 3, and now just solve for x. Now, the rest of these, example two and example three, example four, and even example four from the previous section, they're the same. Okay? Let's kind of look at example two here. Do you see a three and a six there being in a relationship of one to two? Okay? So, what we do then is take that term right there, let well, u equal it. So, u is equal to x cubed in this case. So then hopefully you can see that u squared would be x to the sixth. So now I can replace that with u squared minus then 26 u's minus 27 is equal to zero. So this thing factors to what, negative 27 and positive 1? 
So u minus 27 is equal to 0. u plus 1 is equal to 0. So u is equal to 27. And u is equal to negative 1, right? But what was u? x cubed. So we're going to substitute back that in. I get x cubed equals 27. And then x cubed equals negative 1. Now, when you take the cube root of something, um, we don't worry about the plus or minus. Okay. Uh, and... We can take square or cube roots of negative numbers. So I'm going to take the cube root of 27. I'm looking for a number that I multiply by itself three times to get 27. So that's three. So cube root of 27 is three. And when I do that over here, one number multiplied by itself three times will give me negative one. Negative one. So the cube root of negative one is negative one. And just like any other equation, you can plug those values back into the original thing. Plug 3 into x to the 6 minus 26, x cubed minus 27. You will get 0 back when you do that. Is that all right? Okay. Um, just so you can get an, uh, like I said, I'll go through the, the remaining examples of that technique. Um, but just to get kind of a, a, a jump start here on absolute value and whatever we don't cover with absolute value, I will also put... Uh, together a short video for that um, and I apologize they're not my notes so my pacing is a little bit off and um, when Cheryl gets back it won't be you know you got to watch 10 15 minute videos outside of class um, to get what you didn't cover in class um, but when it says what does absolute value of X mean you guys know what absolute value is yeah the distance X is from zero Okay, that's what we're talking about, absolute value there. Um, the, so, so whenever you're dealing with absolute value, when we're, when we're dealing with absolute value, there's always going to be two aspects to it. Because if I'm, from, if I'm starting at zero, put yourself on the number line at zero, you could walk a distance of, let's say, three units to the right, correct? But you could also walk three units to the left, correct? So there's two locations, two positions, that would be three units away from zero. One to the right of zero and one to the left of zero. So everything that we do has to kind of address that. So this first example, i gonna just give you a set of rules here. When you have the absolute value of some expression equal to some constant, okay? You set it up and you say ax plus b is equal to c. And essentially what that does is it gives you the value of x that will put that expression x plus c, or sorry, x plus b, c units to the right of zero. Does that make sense? Okay. But we also know we can go to the left of zero, so you're right, or ax plus b could equal the opposite of c, which basically means that now that when I solve that for x, it's going to put the expression x plus b c units to the left of zero. All right, so in this problem here, our ax plus b is this 2x minus 5 stuff. So we'll take 2x minus 5 is equal to 3. We'll solve that in a moment. But we're also going to write or 2x minus 5 is equal to the opposite of 3. Two equations now that we, we should have the abilities to solve. Add 3 to both sides. I get 2x is equal to 8. And then x is 4 here, right? And then here I have uh, 2x is equal to, add 5, I get 2. x is 1, correct? So what we're doing there, those two solutions, what they mean to us. If I'm on a number line, and 0 is there, and 3 is right there, and negative 3 is right there, okay? X equaling 4 will put my expression of 2x minus 5 right there, 3 units away from 0. Does that make sense? When x is equal to 1, it's going to put my expression of 2x minus 5 right here to the left of 0, 3 units away uh, from zero on the left-hand side of zero. Is that okay with everybody? Okay. 
plug in those values. Plug in one. 2x minus 5. 2 minus 5 gives me negative 3, right? Does the absolute value of negative 3 equal 3? Yeah. If I plug in 4, I get 8 minus 5, right? Does the absolute value of 3 equal 3? Yeah. Okay. So those are my two solutions. Okay. Um, the only thing with, with absolute value, and this will be the last thing I tell you before I let you go, is you before you apply that rule, you know, if you'll, I look at that rule, AX plus B is equal to C, the absolute value bars are isolated, right? They're by themselves. So this thing here, you can't apply the rule yet. You have to take 3 times the absolute value of X minus 7, subtract 5 from both sides so I get that, right? Now divide both sides by 3, X minus 7 is equal to 3. And now does that look like that? Now you can apply that rule, right? We want to apply rules um, that have this general kind of format. You got to make sure that the, the current prop problem that you're on models that format, Matt, before you apply the rules. Okay. Um, there's always a trick question that they always ask. Really, not necessarily trick, but something like this. Absolute value of x minus 5, I will subtract 7 from both sides, gives me negative 15, right? And I'll talk about this again in my video. But the absolute value, absolute value is always what kind of number? Positive. Distance or length is always positive. Right there it's saying the absolute value of something is a negative number. Can absolute value be a negative number? No. So they're saying whatever you find x to be, let's say x was 20. You get 20 minus 5 is the absolute value of 15, right? Is the absolute value of 15 ever going to look like negative 15? No. Okay. So this is automatically right away no solution. Okay. Um, I just wanted to show you that because I guarantee you on your first exam and maybe even on your final, they will put a question like that on there. Okay. Um, that it's just every every college algebra math teacher thinks that, and I do it myself. They think that's that's awesome. That's going to get somebody to, to mess up and apply the rule and get the wrong answer. Okay, so keep that in mind as as you, as you guys prepare. Um, I apologize for again my timing on this stuff, but uh, uh, remember I will put.